Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode number two of Eat, Speak, Compete, where we go down all of the news and goings on in esports and gaming and everything going on in the scene. I'm your host, as always, Yeso, joined by my co host, Luke Shimonahi Brew. Happy Tuesday. We're recording this Tuesday, August 24th. How are we doing, my man? We're good. We are indeed recording it on Tuesday, usually Mondays. Yes. Had a little bit of a crazy day yesterday and a crazy day today. So yeah. here we are. We're recording it. You know, there's been a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and uh, I'm excited to talk about it. So let's do it. Yeah, we got a huge range of stuff to talk about today. The latest in the LCS and mm. the League of Legends scene as a whole. A world championship in Call of Duty and big news for some big shooter franchises. So lots of cover. We're going to run through it all here today, but let's kick it off with the league scene. We had another weekend of LCS playoffs this last week, and we actually had four matches Thursday through Sunday, and we're now down to our final three teams, and we have decided the world's qualifiers for North America. Team Liquid having beaten 100 Thieves, now waiting in Grand Finals for Summer, C9 and 103 Thieves waiting in Losers Finals, and we talked about it in last week's episode, the big budgets for some of these big name teams, and we were talking about how one of them wasn't going to make it to Worlds this year, and it ends up being TSM, that big $3 million support. Sword Art, who played in last year's World Finals, lost, will not be going back to Worlds this year. And I know you have some thoughts specifically on that series. I know you watched it yeah. uh, this weekend. What are your kind of initial thoughts coming in? I mean, it's just been a brutal time for TSM. Like, these guys haven't been able to find their, you know, be, just they haven't been in the swing of things for four or five years now, as far as, like, they barely slid in, I think, one of these years. and been... So now this is the third time in the last four years that TSM hasn't gone to Worlds, and for reference, they qualified for the first seven World Championships, right? Seven in a row through the entire first seven years of the League of Legends esports scene, and now three of the last four, the biggest esports org in the world is not going to the World Championship. Yeah, and it's crazy, too. They have such a diverse roster. They're, yep. picking, they're picking people from all over the world, yeah. getting trying to get the best talent that they possibly can, and... There's, the synergy just isn't there. Yeah. You know what I mean? The whatever the, the practice regimens, which I'm always complaining about, North America's practice <laughs> regimens, especially when it comes to league. Um, but I mean, we're just seeing it happen over and over again, right? So I mean, shout out to Hundred Thieves, I would say in general, because it's super cool seeing um, a newer League of Legends um, or kind of continue to dominate and, and grow within the scene. Because mm -hmm. when those guys first kind of popped in, it was all big names, but no uh, no, no bite. And now actually seeing them dominate the North American scene. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of like the early days of like Cloud9, when like Cloud9 first showed up with like Meteos and all of them and Sneaky. And just mm -hmm. started just like slapping around TSM back in the day, who was yeah. essentially an untouched god at that point in North America. So um, that's super cool to see. I'm excited to see some more 100 Thieves action. Super disappointing, obviously, for TSM, a big TSM fan. Sure. I love seeing them do well, but it's back to the influencer life for them. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, hey, it's what they do best, and it's, you know, might as well just do what you do best. Yeah, so. and, and I mean, I think the interesting discussion is going to be, it's a long offseason, obviously, for TSM. And when you look at this roster, uh, there's a lot of great things. I think you have, uh, you know, the one of the most promising young North American junglers in Spica. I think he was fantastic this year. He was honestly probably their best player. Uh, Huni, I think, had a great year. He's had his past few years have been up and down, but I thought he actually looked really good. Um, Power of Evil, there's been a ton of discussion about his champion pool throughout the season. So I think that is certainly limited, a spot where yeah. they may look to improve. And then obviously lost uh, their AD carry, I think, is another spot. So it's it's likely mid and AD carry where we probably see changes, and I don't think there's any way that Sword Art is going anywhere. You invested all this money in him, and while obviously the first year's return wasn't great, I don't necessarily can think you can shoulder that entirely on him. So uh, I'm curious to see where those changes come, and it's definitely going to be an interesting offseason in North America for a lot of reasons, but especially with TSM not going to Worlds, and they're going to be looking to improve going into next year. So, obviously, a ton of news there. We'll just get double lift back. Uh, yeah, and, well, and that was the thing, right? It's <laughs> like, imagine this is Imagine this is a double lift sword art bottom lane, and I think it's a very different story be because nasty. Lost was largely yeah. the one of the biggest weak points of the team throughout the season. Now, I think he actually played 
a very good series against Cloud9. Obviously, it wasn't enough. Um, but who knows? So now uh, your world's teams from North America will be Team Liquid, 100 Thieves, and Cloud9. Still depends what order they go in in terms of seeding, but those is that's who's going to represent. Also, in other news, uh, Faker coming back. Yeah, okay. T1 qualifies. Uh, they didn't make it last season, but Faker is back at Worlds again, and uh, that's awesome. Obviously, now Love to see eight, eight years after he won his first World Championship, he will be going back once again. So, Gotta love Faker. Big fan. Who isn't mm -hmm. a fan of Faker? So let's see what he can do. I mean, again, I remember watching the first ever League of Legends Worlds where mm -hmm. they did the... Um, Freak's Basement. <laughs> the, yeah, literally, right? They, they did all of the, um, like the 1v1s. They mm -hmm. were like, all right, support 1v1s, and it was just mid lane, you know, first star, first kill, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just like watching Faker just 1v1 kids mid lane, like all the best mids from around the world and stuff. Yeah. It's just like, mm, yeah, I could do that all day. That's just, that's, <laughs> that's the best kind of content. So I'm all in for Faker. Yeah. And also just in other news in terms of world qualifiers, uh, we already knew about Rogue and Mad Lions coming out of EU, yeah. but we get Fnatic will be they the took final G2, right? representative. They beat G2 mm -hmm. in five games, which is crazy. And that's for the first time in G2's history they're not going to Worlds. They've gone to the last five World Championships wow. since they qualified for uh, the you know European uh, yep. LCS back in time. Now it's the the LEC. So that's crazy. Obviously, uh, a, a big stacked team over there. That's another squad that'll have a very interesting off season. But Fnatic, just think about Fnatic that. TSM cool. and G two. No, not at Worlds. Two. I mean, biggest. Well, some of the biggest rosters mm -hmm. are on. You know, both regions, so mm -hmm. it's just how it is. Yeah, it's crazy. Welcome to the new age. Yeah, <laughs> that does it uh, for the League Esports news. Now we got to talk a little bit of Call of Duty. Not yeah. something we talked about last week outside of the business sense, but the 2021 Call of Duty League Championship happened this past weekend, and the Atlanta Phase take a 5-3 win over the Toronto Ultra, and this is notable especially because uh, the Phase actually... Uh, phase finished second to the Dallas Empire a year ago. So they came up just short of that world championship a year ago. And now they come in this weekend and they're able to grab it. So big congratulations to them. Honestly, a, a huge achievement there for Phase, And it's a big year. You know, obviously there was the, the shift for the Call of Duty League from five-man rosters to four for the season. And uh, I know a lot of teams are worried about that. But it looks like Phase handled the change well and had a fantastic year. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, once, once they moved the lead to YouTube, yeah. right, I feel like the overall coverage for me personally, like I feel like I was just seeing a lot less, right, because I'm so heavily like on Twitch all the time, um, but they're still pulling pretty decent numbers over there. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I like to compare it to like the ALGS and like, you know, those type of tournaments that, that they're usually hosting and, you know, outside of like the championships, right, you know, they're sure. still dealing with 30, 40K concurrent at like a minimum, mm -hmm. which feels pretty strong, even on YouTube, especially, right? Like, again, you know, not necessarily a tournament viewing platform per sure. se, um, but every time you see phase, yeah. but also optic primarily, phase probably in the second or third slot, but optic primarily, those YouTube viewership can really spike. Like we've seen like uh, between like probably like 100 and 130,000 mm -hmm. concurrent almost every time Optic plays and yeah. a little bit less when Phase is up. So, you know, I think I think it's pretty cool still seeing how many people are invested in the Call of Duty World League, yeah. um, especially at this state, at this stage in the game, pretty mm -hmm. late into the game, right? We even, we're seeing trailers for the new games coming out. Which we um, will talk about you later. Know, obviously, you know, Blizzard Activision, not necessarily the, the favorite um, of, of a lot of people's, you know, top of mind, things like that. But still sure. being able to pull these, this type of viewership, still create great shows, etc., cetera, um, has been pretty cool. So, you know, I, you know, again, not a huge Call of Duty fan, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the numbers they're pulling, obviously, are still showing that there is just an obscene amount of interest in that space. And seeing teams like FaZe and Optic, yeah. who are still around and still pulling insane numbers in those communities. And then, obviously, you know, you got the... Um, the newer teams as well who are popping up through the, that kind of regional mm -hmm. um, type concept or whatever it is. But pretty cool. You know, it's shout out to FaZe. Good for them. You know, keep crushing it in, in those scenes. I'm excited to see what they do with Halo. You know, yeah. Halo Infinite coming up. I'm excited again to see the teams like the Optic and the FaZe continue to dominate because that's really what they're known for. Yeah. They were always known for just being the best, being like, you know, the team that everybody wants to be on, the cool kids, whatever it yeah. is. Maybe a little frat boyish here and there <laughs> to an extent for sure. But, um, you know, regardless, um, huge congratulations to those guys. And I'm excited to see uh, just you know, 
what else you know the Call of Duty world they can keep pumping out for us. Yeah, I think the point you make about Infinite is really interesting because I, you know Halo has been for a long time one of the staple shooter esports, but it's never quite reached the level at the at the very least over like the last decade of like the CS:GOs and things like that. And I'm very curious to see with the state of esports as it is right now and Halo Infinite coming out and this could be you know, this could possibly be the best Halo title we've seen since, like, Halo 3. You know, this could be a very defining title in the in the Halo franchise, and I'm very curious to see what kind of esports scene develops out of it. I think it, there is a potential for this to be the biggest Halo esports has ever been, and now when you look at orgs like 100 Thieves, FaZe, Optic, maybe some other orgs that aren't necessarily in this space as much looking to jump in. Obviously, we have C9 has been in there. I'm really excited to see how that scene develops so uh you know love to see this for face clan big congratulations to them huge championship weekend but i think there is uh the just shooter esports i think is really uh looking to have kind of a revolution here over the next year so i think that's super exciting leave it to me to derail our call of duty conversation into halo <laughs> of course yeah. i do that whatever i mean it is what it is we talk about everything and you know all all, all different kind of gaming stuff but let's talk a little smash Okay. Uh, not a, a, a ton going on, but we did have the Central America Ultimate Regional Finals uh, last weekend. And surprising to probably no one, MKLeo comes out and wins it, beats uh, Maester 3-0 in Grand Finals. Uh, and that is uh, part of Smash World Tour, so he qualifies uh, for the championship for that. Uh, Maester will be going as well, but big dub for, for MKLeo and the Smash team just keeps prowling, you know, or plowing through. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because for those of you who don't necessarily um, follow Smash too closely, there's never really been like a, you know, Call of Duty World League, right? Overwatch World League, yeah. League of Legends World, right? There's never been like that full world-long circuit because, again, Nintendo doesn't necessarily support the esports side yeah. of the of the scene. It's always been so community-driven. Uh, so VGBC, which is a, um, you know, super cool... Um, I don't, know, I, I don't know what other word to use other than company or organization, um, that essentially has collected like leaders from the Smash world all over and, mm -hmm. you know, sync them all together, right? They put yeah. together this full circuit. They got TOs running tournaments in every individual region, you know, tournaments that obviously lead into, like you're mentioning, you know, the world, the world championship where these guys like MK Leo and, and, and Meister will be playing. Um, so one, I think that is super cool. Just being able to see that kind of structured competition play uh, in the Super Smash Brothers world uh, hasn't been seen before, so it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, actually seeing these, you know, people like MK Leo and Mike all these guys return to lands. Yeah. Because again, these events are all at land, so the production quality was super awesome to watch. It was honestly like super solid. Um, and the the matchups, like we haven't really got to see almost any land play outside of like local, you know, like MSMs down here, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like local weeklies. Um, in quite a while, yeah. you know, so the, the level of gameplay was awesome to see uh, MK Leo, who is the best Super Smash Bros. Ultimate player in the world, um, is gross. He, he's, he's absolutely, he's, he's astronomical. He, he mains, like, just whatever new DLC characters are coming out. He just picks them up and then just dominates everybody with them. Uh, this most recent tournament, he ran through with Byleth, yeah. who the main character from uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses that just recently came out. Like one a, of like a, a the dozen different so. Fire Emblem games. The newest one though, for the Nintendo <laughs> sure, Switch. Sure, sure, yeah. The one that mo I assume the majority <laughs> of people listening are, have played or at least are aware of if they are aware of the Final Fantasy uh, or the Final Fantasy, the Fire, Fire Emblem, Emblem genre. Um, and it was really cool to see him playing kind of a not top tier character, if you will. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, I'm not saying Bob isn't good, but definitely nowhere near, you know, the top 10, top 20 characters in the game. Sure. Which a lot of times when you talk about fighting games, you only see people playing those specific top tier titles yeah. or characters. So it's cool to see him pick a not so top tier character and dominate an entire region. Like he only switched off Byleth for one matchup. He went Joker, who's his real main and also mm -hmm. the best character in the game, um, and just ruined this kid in, in game five. He would put up the best fight of the day because yeah. he was the only guy who made him switch off Byleth and yeah. play his real character. So shout out to him. I wish I knew his name, but sorry, yeah. brother. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it, was a, it was a great tournament to watch. I would definitely recommend catching it on YouTube if you can. Um, and, and there's more regional finals coming up. Tons more. Obviously leading up to the you know Smash World 2 Championship, which is slated for late 2021, no set dates. But definitely plenty more Smash to watch, which is super exciting. I think 
you make a really good point when you highlight talking about BGBC and the way that they've built the tour, the, the, the circuit. And I think it's something that uh, builds on something I've noticed about watching the FGC and, you know, I know people say Smash isn't FGC, but it's, it's kind of it's, it's in the same friend, space. Yeah. Um, when you compare it to other esports, these are the most wide open and like the least barrier to entry of any esport. And I think it's really cool. It's so heavily based around because so many of these games are heavily community driven. They're so heavily built around going to locals and things like that. And it's like the best player of the world, the best players in the world are going to come through. They're going to go, they're going to start going to locals as young players and they're going to play through that. And they're just going to slowly work their way up through these different scenes up into bigger, bigger in bigger tournaments and up into the biggest, uh, you know, stages. And I think that's super cool. You know, I, I think in other esports like league and whatever, you know, you have this solo queue mentality and streaming and all these kind of ways to get known. But I think Huge. going and it's a, just a big difference, right? It's not just going out and playing solo queue. It's like, no, you've got to go to your weekly tournament every Monday or whatever it is. You got to go to your MSMs, play through that, start succeeding there, start growing and learning and then, Qualify to the bigger tournaments. You got to be going to CEO or whatever, and uh, and and I think that is really cool and a, such an awesome and unique thing about the Smash scene and the FGC scene uh, as a well as well that really sets it apart from kind of everything else. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, there's there's very few esports where you could walk into a tournament and play against the best player in the world. Yeah, like. What do you, like, do you know how hard it would be for me to play against any LCS League of Legends team? I mean, it's impossible. The amount of times... <laughs> but, like, I could go play against the best match player by just going to a local. Yeah, the amount of times <laughs> that we had, like, some of the best Japanese players in, like, Tekken and Street Fighter coming to our arena, right? They're out in Southern California, and they come to WNF, just on a Wednesday, and all of a sudden, like, a top 10 Tekken player in the world is just at your local, and you can play against them, and that's not, like... A, a crazy thing like that's just kind of a normal thing if they're in the area they're going to come to that event that's i think it's incredible grow as a community too because yeah. right? they want to teach and learn and people want to play against them and get better and all that kind of stuff so <laughs> gotta love the fgc and smash scenes it's just uh very community driven and that's you know has its ups and its downs and sure it, but like with a company like bgbc coming in and like really kind of piecing everything together and like still giving that world exposure mm -hmm. What else can you ask for? Yeah, it's awesome. Hats off to MK Leo. Big win there. Take it first. At, again, the Central America Ultimate Regional Finals. So congratulations to him. On to Halo news. Mm. And we're not talking Halo Infinite this time. We're talking Halo 2. Ooh, uh, we had a Halo 2 Twitch Rivals uh, hosted by Ninja. Uh, last week, he brought together some of the biggest names in Halo 2 esports. We're talking... T squared, our our buddy, Snipe Down, Elamite, Maniac, Ooh, and more. It was sixteen yeah. players that came out uh, for a four team battle. Elamite squad, the agency, uh, ends up winning it, and our boy Tom T squared Taylor comes in last place. Sadly, yeah, definitely my favorite my favorite part of the whole thing. I mean, one I'm a big Ninja fan, love Ninja, think that guy's awesome. He's always mm -hmm. he's always out there doing fun stuff. So this was a, a blast to watch with him just commentating over it, throwing money out of his pocket like it's nothing. I think it was what, what Ninja I think added. so. I don't know what the prize pool was originally, but he came in and said he was just adding a hundred thousand dollars on top of. I want to say it was one hundred fifty thousand dollars before that. So Sick. it was it was either it was either fifty k and he added hundred k to hit hit one hundred and fifty, mm -hmm. or it was one hundred and fifty and he made it two fifty. It was okay. one or the other, but it was super awesome watching that uh, from the ninja side. Obviously, uh, at the end, I think Tom tweeted out saying that uh, he was going to use the five thousand dollars he got from Ninja to buy himself some new thumbs because <laughs> uh, uh, you know it, it's it's cool seeing all these veterans play. Mm -hmm. Obviously, any of our older gamers who are listening uh, probably uh, feel the sentiment of your hands slowly degrading whatever yeah. you know if you're a controller player when you're a kid your thumbs are probably on fire if you've been a mouse and keyboard kid most of your life your hands probably just hurt in general your wrists, your yeah. wrists and whatnot right so um you know it's 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 fun seeing all the uh the vets kind of get together and have a good time with it um good job tom you know you had to try those all, yeah. all the gods in one room someone had to get last so yeah and i mean i think the one of the coolest things about it was the format right you had 16 mm -hmm. players come in and they played free for all to determine drafting order and then they they did a snake yep. draft and drafted teams which i think is really interesting and fun for that kind of event obviously you're never going to see something like that in a top tier event because teams are just going to come in set but i thought that was super cool obviously you know our boss the man himself tyler andrus 
big Halo 2 fan. He would have put them in the floor. Uh, I would love to see that. I, I mean, I think at some point we need to get a Tom versus Tyler Halo match. You know, maybe we you, we pull together two teams. Like um, I'm prepped and ready. I, I don't. I don't think we allow. Have to, I don't think we can let Tom bring in the full straight rip and roster. Them all, I don't man, know that that would be fair. I, be, I believe in our boys. Hey, okay? all right. Uh, you know, I mean, Sam Ward was founded on H two, and we're gonna rep it to the end. Sam so. Ward Tyler Andrews is a strong combo. Very, very heat. Very yeah. heated. So we may have to do that in the future. But the format was super cool. The event was awesome. Hard Getting to, to go it, down right? to go. Huh? I feel like it was a little hard to watch stream wise. Cause like there's just no spectating client for Halo 2, so we were stuck watching um, individual POVs yeah. of, of streams, and like that's not how you watch Halo. That was hard. But what are you gonna do? You can't complain about it. it doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, so we take what we get. But other than that, I totally agree. It was a blast. Yeah. Very very cool event. So love to see that, and hoping to see you know maybe some more throwback Twitch Rivals event. I, I think trip Twitch Rivals has been uh, really cool. I know I think they're doing Rocket League like as we. Uh, record this episode uh, but it's really cool to see all the different stuff that they've been doing yep. uh, and I hope that you know the kind of uh, willingness to kind of go outside of the box and do these different titles maybe inspires uh, some other TOs to do some cool stuff I know we do put plenty of different things here uh, so that's super exciting but moving on to some other news we talked a little bit of LCS at the start and I want to talk uh, specifically about Danny he was the 80 carry for Evil Geniuses this year, uh, and he is, I believe, still 17 years old. So this is a kid that had never played professionally before. He was competing uh, in amateur earlier this year and going into the summer split. EG decided to make a change. They moved this 80 carry from amateur, skip him entirely past the academy scene to be their starting 80 carry. Uh, he had, obviously, some struggles early on, but finished the summer strong. He wins... Rookie of the Year for the LCS, earns the second team All-Pro 80 carry, so nominated as the second best 80 carry in North America this season, uh, and had a fantastic showing. He had that crazy unofficial pentakill against 100 Thieves in their series with them last weekend, and I think it, it's just such a fantastic story. Another just bright, young NA star, and I know the community for years has been hungry for North America to invest and develop young, fresh talent. And when you look at names like Spica, who we talked about earlier, and now Danny and others, it seems like North America is starting to show the untapped potential of their young pros. Good. Yeah. Like, thank you for doing literally anything. Like, just a heads up play, 100% yeah. coming out from uh, Evil Geniuses there. It's just like... We know that there's talent everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And I talk about, again, the practice regimen thing. It's hard to even show yourself, mm -hmm. show that you're good at League of Legends, right? You have to jump through all these hoops, playing Challenger Series forever, maybe get lucky streaming, someone notices you, you beat some good player in, in uh, a ranked game, yeah. and they look you up, like that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to see these guys identify talent, skip the academy process, right? Because the academy process should be like your backup team that you're training Replacements, you're testing out players, you're you know, I mean, I using think them as sam to literally, like, your academy team should be playing against your LCS team every single day. I agree. It's ludicrous every single day because you're, you need to find those, those top talents. Finding mm -hmm. How many 17-year-old players do you think can play like that in North America? I mean, who knows? I, I think it is a larger number than maybe has been shown uh, over the last few years, and that's what's been cool about, like, the scouting ground circuit that uh, the the LCS team has put together, uh, and they've obviously integrated academy and amateur together more as now they compete in a lot of tournaments throughout the year uh, in in the same you know environment, which is awesome. But I, I completely agree. I think there is there just continues to be untapped potential when you look at the NA talent, um, and you know it's obviously hard to say when you look at the teams that qualified for Worlds, right? I think there's only, uh, what, two, like, natural-born NA players. Like, there's obviously a ton of residents. Like, Jensen is technically considered an NA player because he's played in NA for so long and he got residency. But, like, <laughs> when you look at the actual yep. natural-born NA pros, there's only a, a couple on those teams. So North America is still so heavily based on imports, but it's why players like Danny are so valuable because it's like every time 
you get one of those insanely strong North American players, that opens up an import slot, right? You don't have to import an AD carry. Danny's fucking sick. Just play him. Go import somewhere else. So uh, it's only going to make them better. I'm sad that EG doesn't go to Worlds this year. Yeah. But I'm looking at next season, and I'm like, I think your team looked really strong. You were really making good progress this season. So whatever changes you feel like you need to make, I don't think they're huge. And I'm excited for year two, Danny, because year one, and it was just a single split, right? We didn't even get to see him the whole year. Yep. Which just summer was incredibly impressive. And especially when you consider this dude is so young. I mean, he literally just finished high school a couple of months ago, and he's already popping off in the LCS. I think he has a, a very bright future. I'm all about it. It's awesome. So love to hear that. Uh, let's talk a little bit of Rainbow Six. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege had their first LAN major since all this has gone down. Uh, they went down to Mexico for the R6 Mexico major. And a couple of players from North American team Dark Zero tested positive for COVID during the event. And obviously, as we talk about different events coming back to LAN... This is something that's going to crop up, and it is a very interesting thing. Obviously, uh, one thing we'll talk about later with the League of Legends scene is them also moving their world championship, uh, and I don't know. It, it's a hard thing to talk about. COVID has obviously been so disruptive for everybody in the world. Yeah, tell us about it. Every business, <laughs> um, and we're all trying to figure out what is our new normal, Right, and everybody is trying to get back to as close a, a representation of the old normal as soon as possible, but also trying to be safe. And you know, I think thankfully uh, the response was really good from the entire staff at the major. Uh, the players were even able to play their match. Just it ended up being remote, which I think is fantastic. They were able to adapt, but you know, I think this is the first of probably multiple stories that are going to happen. Lands are going to return and this is going to happen. And I think the hope is that TOs are prepared and willing to be nimble to keep events going and protect players and, and, and try and work around these issues that are going to crop up. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard topic to yeah. tackle, right? Certainly. Because there's so many factors involved in like every aspect of it. And it's just like, you know, the TOs can only do so much, and it's great to obviously see them be able to adapt, but, like, how much did they put into that event to have it be sure. ran remote anyway? Yeah. And it's, like, one of those things where, you know, I've, I've even heard um, of stories of, um, you know, proof of vaccination being required to even attend specific events, mm -hmm. and then people still come back positive from COVID. And, yeah, and it's like through infections for do, sure. Do you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's one of those things where, like, it's almost like no matter how many safety protocols that you put in place, like, there's... There's always that chance, like yep. you said, right? So being able to adapt and be nimble um, is probably a, a requirement for these next, you know, coming year or so plus, who knows? Sure. Um, but definitely this next cycle of physical events, it's, you know, that's why a lot of companies are still opting to hold off on physical events, right? Mm -hmm. You got like the, the EAs and the, um, you know, the Epic Games and et cetera of the world who are just kind of like, what? Nah, we're good. We'll wait. You know what I mean? And just put your hands up and wait. Yeah. And I mean, I respect it, right? I think uh, there's been a very good move from a lot of these companies to take player safety and their, and it's their staff, right? It's your people that are going to be going and producing these events, right? And taking all of these people's safety into very high consideration. And I think that's fantastic to hear. Obviously, uh, these, these companies are taking this very seriously and striking the balance between taking it seriously and trying to put on these land events is difficult, but it seems like for the most part, what I've seen over the last couple months is they're doing it right. And I think that is very commendable. So it's definitely hats off uh, to everybody over there at the Rainbow Six team and Ubisoft. I think that's fantastic to see. And obviously, uh, you know, hopefully we hope that the two players that tested positive, hope they're doing well and they, you know, they heal up good, but obviously uh, definitely a very difficult situation. Also, congratulations, just a side note, obviously the major finish. Congratulations to Team One Esports, a uh, Brazilian team, uh, wins the R6 major and they win a cool, you know, 200 grand. No Slap big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really I don't really follow R6 too much. It seems yeah. like a pretty young game. 
in the sense of like a lot of their player base seems to be relatively younger, sure. which I find a little surprising. Because um, the title isn't necessarily because the title young. doesn't give that off. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that their player base is like under 20, like all of them. Mm-hmm. So I'm not too sure about the pro teams and, and if they're also kind of on the younger side or not. But overall, that's a lot of money. So shout out. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to those guys. <laughs> so uh, we highlighted it earlier, talked at the top of the show. We got some big news for uh, a couple of the big shooter franchises. And one we got to talk about first is Call of Duty. Man, Call of Duty just keeps finding its way back into right? the conversation. <laughs> you thought we were done. Uh, we are not. And what we are talking about now is uh, Call of Duty Vanguard. You can actually see the trailer playing uh, just over my shoulder here on the TV in the studio. And they officially released the first trailer for the new title that comes, uh, releases in November 5th. The series is going back to World War II. Interestingly enough, four years after we had Call of Duty World War yeah. II, uh, which is interesting. I will say, uh, I watched the trailer. It looked Really cool. Uh, at the same time, I have also officially sworn off buying Call of Duty games. Uh, and, you know, I think obviously they still have a huge audience and they still continue to make games that people want to buy, which, cool. Hats off to you. I think that's great. Um, but what are your thoughts here on uh, the new title? I mean, it's just, it's another year, another Call of Duty, right? Another year, another Call of Duty. Uh, if there's one thing that Activision can do extraordinarily well, it's make trailers. <laughs> Damn, that trailer. <laughs> I was watching that trailer, but I just goosebumps. And that's not a diss. Just, that's not a diss. But it's it's just... a half diss, but like, it's not a diss on the video. Like, sure, sure. absolutely incredible video. Yeah, I Made agree. me want to play the game, absolutely. Am I going to? No chance. Uh, I, <laughs> I also, have the same conflict. I haven't, I, bought like, a call, I haven't bought a Call of Duty game in probably five years, and I'm going to keep rocking that that yeah. path down. I've got a couple of them, you know, sure. just kind of through um, people just like giving it to me and stuff, and I've, I've played it. I've played the last several iterations, and, and mm. you know, it's just not, it's just not for me. It's mm. just, the, the genre isn't for me, but, um, you know, I'm excited to see what they decide to do with, like, Warzone this time around. I mean, I feel like in the Call of Duty, or the Cold War adaption, um, was a little weak, okay. I want to say, right? Like, yeah, I get it, it's the new map, it's the new gun and stuff, or the new guns, new skins, mm. that whole kind of nine yards, and I'm not really sure what else they can really do with it, um, but I, you know, I, I'd maybe like to see um, just kind of like a, a little bit of a revamp on, on Warzone in general, maybe smaller lobbies. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. You know, again, I'm not a huge Call of Duty guy, but the Warzone scene I feel like was continuously like trying to pop off, but it yeah. just got, it was just stuck in the streamer realm only. Yeah. It was like, oh, you're a streamer? Yeah, all the streamers play Warzone because, you know, it's easy to kill people, fast kill times, tons of people in the lobbies. So you get super high kill games, tons yeah. of action, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a great streaming game. Yeah. But when it came to like, you know, tournaments and, and events and it was just so it felt relatively lackluster um so i'm excited to see if there, if there can be made some progress there and then of course you got the call of duty world league which you know would be great if it adopted warzone and mm-hmm. got some kind of additional com- uh, competitive components of it but you know it's always cool to see a new call of duty come out call of duty world league will soup it up and adapt into the multiplayer so it, i imagine it'll be exactly the same exactly what everybody expects is going to happen is going to happen again um, and hopefully they, you know, it can at least add some Warzone spice to maybe push that a little bit more towards, you know, where Apex Legends and sure. where Fortnite used to be and things like that. Maybe Warzone might be able to crawl its way there. Yeah. And I mean, the, the interesting thing when you talk about Warzone and it's a conversation that's been going on for a long time, but very specifically over the last four to six weeks is one thing we've been talking about here is some of the biggest streamers on Twitch coming to Apex Legends. And a lot of that has been very specifically spurred by two factors. One, Apex is continuing to peak right now, which is awesome. Their releases over the last couple of seasons have been very good. They're drawing in a lot of new players. But the other big factor is there's so many players that play Warzone. That's their main battle royale they like to play. But there's been issues with cheaters. And that has been something that's been running rampant. And a lot of players feel like Activision Blizzard has not put maybe as much time as they should into developing anti-cheat and preventing these things in Warzone, and they've come to Apex and found a game where they feel like the competitive integrity is just higher. Uh, And I think, you know, players come to Apex, I think that's fantastic. I love the title. Obviously, we love the title as a company. I think it's been great for us. Um, But, I mean, you know, Rising Tide uh, raises all ships, and I think we would also love to see Warzone get the improvements that the community wants, and hopefully that is something that comes with this new title as they feel like, 
all right, we got this new title coming out. We're going to have another new little revamp on Warzone, and hopefully they put in that work so that players want to come back to Warzone, because I know they do, right? You look at Courage, Tim the Tatman, Nick Merckx, like, they love Apex, but they also want to play Warzone, but they just feel like they can't with the state of the game right now. Yeah, but, you know, I just sit there and I look at Apex, and I'm like, dude, there's literally cheaters everywhere in Apex Legends at the same time. So it makes me feel like it's not that... You know, obviously the competitive integrity is one thing, but it's sure. it's almost like a step further than that, where it's like, who's the best Warzone player? Nobody knows. No, right, no rank system, too. Do you, yeah. you want to know why? Because nobody, it doesn't matter. Again, yeah. it's just a streamer game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's literally, there's there's no backbone to the game at all. But then you look at a game like Apex Legends that has so much competitive support. Mm -hmm. And even if it's the pro players just crying about it on Twitter and the developers just telling them that they're trying <laughs> and like them just going back and forth in an indefinite circle. Sure. But that's healthy for the game. It's communication. It's, you know, like, oh, wow, Seer's broken, whatever. Ball, let's cry about Seer for two weeks because they only made him broken so that they could make everyone buy him and then nerf him. Is that what they did? Yes. <laughs> but does it matter? No, that's not the point because, you know, there's that, there's that constant communication online. Sure. There's the constant events being popped up. Uh, EA and Respawn, they do a really great job of engaging with their influencers and the pro organizations. Mm -hmm. They put a bunch of support into the grassroots scene. So it's just like, it is an absolute Activision whole. But Activision doesn't care. That's not where their money comes from. Sure. That's not where their sales, they're one of the best selling games of all time. So it's just mm -hmm. like, it's an impossible cycle and I don't think it's going to be broken. Uh, but that also means that games like Apex Legends have an opportunity to dominate the scene long term. Mm -hmm. Long term. So I'd I'm, I'm excited just to see you know, what keeps developing there. And obviously, you know, it also leaves holes. This is kind of a pivot concept, but it also leaves holes for, you know, uh, game developers like, you know, Dr. Disrespect to come in and invent their own game studio and invent their own game with influencers and completely dominate Warzone. Yeah. Like if Dr. Disrespect teams up with Tim Tim Tatman and Nate Shaw and all 100 Thieves and Ninja and all these guys to create a game that they want and they have input in, they have stake in, yeah. and they're all streaming that game, What's going to happen to Warzone if it's only a streamer game? Uh, we're even already seeing it right now where with the lack of people streaming it, it's already, you know, declining. But again, will Activision care? Probably not. Right? I mean, we talked about... <laughs> so that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, right. We talked about the hundreds of millions of dollars in mobile shooters last, oh gosh, uh, last week's dude. episode. So yeah. who knows? It may not be uh, a big thing to them. Uh, in other Battle Royale news, let's talk about Naughty Dog. Uh, okay. The Last of Us has been... One of the biggest franchises of the last decade, uh, the first title and the second, have been uh, extremely popular games. Some of the most groundbreaking uh, single-player titles we've seen in this century, which is, is crazy. Um, and apparently Naughty Dog is reportedly working on a Last of Us Battle Royale, or at the very least were uh, at, at some point. Uh, it appears that uh, game files were found to indicate that a battle, battle royale was at least in development at some point. Uh, when The Last of Us 2 released, Naughty Dog obviously put out uh, an announcement because the factions multiplayer from the first game was wildly popular, but Naughty Dog came out and said basically that The Last of Us 2 was so ambitious, the single player was so big and the biggest project that they'd, they'd ever worked on that they felt like they really needed to just invest all their resources there and that players would eventually get to play a multiplayer and it looks like it could possibly be a battle royale which i think is really interesting did you play a lot of last of us either of the first two titles no uh i am familiar in, sure. to a certain extent i know it's, it's relatively popular even now at the end of its life cycle it's, mm -hmm. it's still got a a player base yeah probably not a huge active player base but it still has a player base mm -hmm. Um, you know, which is, you know, a lot to be said. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard to keep people playing your game and to have an active, uh, daily player base is, is impressive in its own. Um, do I think that companies should stop making battle royales? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm all about it. You we know, get it. We yeah, get it. Yeah. We get it. I, I get, you know, people love the battle royale genre. They saw the popularity of Fortnite. So everyone just kind of attacked it and sure. started making it. And it. It could have just been that where that happened. And so they immediately jumped on it, but it didn't end up panning out. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I would say it's, it's neutral for me either way. If it does come out, it'll probably be popular for a month and disappear. Yeah. If it doesn't come out. I mean, the most curious thing for me would just be to all of those players that have played The Last of Us for all these years, and especially the ones who love the factions multiplayer from the first title, do they feel like Battle Royale scratches the itch for them? My default answer off the rip would be 
Probably not. They're probably looking for just an evolution of what they've played prior. Um, but, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I'm like you. Uh, you know, I played some of the first one. Uh, Last of Us kind of just kicked my ass, though. That's <laughs> completely fair. <laughs> and I was just like, uh, after probably like 10 hours, I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm just not feeling this. You it's really have to put a lot of time me. into it. Yeah, but, it's like and, a very achieve hunting in yeah. respect to the titles, I know, you know, Naughty Dog is revered uh, as one of the best yep. uh, developers, especially in the single player story base. I mean, you look at Uncharted and that entire series and now The Last of Us, they've had just groundbreaking titles. And, uh, you know, am I kind of curious to see what their take on a battle royale is? Sure. And I think it would be very likely a unique take on the genre but at the same time i'm kind of with you i've played the battle royales i kind of know what i want from them yeah right i know what i want from them so i'm not really itching for a new battle royale title but i guess all i would hope is that you know whatever they do decide to do satisfies that very dedicated fan base of theirs uh because that's really who it should be for so i hope that they and i i would imagine they take that into consideration i think that's the most important thing so have to wait and see Yep. What, do you, what do you got, Naughty Dog? Give it to us. Yes. <laughs> Last couple of things to talk about here. First one, we're going to talk about a little business news. Venn. One of the big companies that came out over the last couple of years trying to push into the esports, gaming, and news space. Furlough nearly half of their staff Again. late last week, <laughs> and they cancel uh, what I believe is their most popular show, Face Check, which is hosted by uh, Degon, uh, a buddy of ours, as well as I Will Dominate and LS, talking about everything going on in the League of Legends scene. So uh, the plan is reportedly that they are working on uh, getting Face Check into a space or working with someone else so that they continue to produce the show, but it will no longer live under the Venn banner and Venn is just at this point preparing to get bought out by another company so it's unfortunate news but uh an interesting story at the very least yeah i feel like there was like a big splash when they first showed up right yeah they showed up with like a ton their, of money their debut popped they, off they like bought a bunch of like you know influence or talent shows mm -hmm. they like developed all this like uh exclusive and, and original ip mm -hmm. um and then they just kind of fizzled and like their numbers off launch just continued to go down um and i'm sure they just burned through their their cash reserves without any kind of income on the back end i imagine yeah um so yeah i can't say i'm necessarily surprised i guess um uh, just kind of based on you know what i've read um and the numbers that i've seen out of what's been coming out of them but uh, it's obviously unfortunate you know, to, sure. see it, to see a company come in with, like, that much swing and then just to, like, it feels like almost disappear out of nowhere. Yeah. It's it's interesting. It really felt like the goal of Venn coming in was to be, like, the ESPN of esports. They were going to do the new shows and cover like that, have their kind of talking head stuff, as well as doing some of the gaming lifestyle content, which I think is really good. And I mean, one thing I've noticed of, of like the content that I watch from them, I think Face Check is fantastic. And a lot of stuff that I have seen from a content standpoint has been good. But I don't know. It just, I guess, you know, when you look at the numbers, the community just hasn't necessarily had uh, a thirst for it. I think it's really interesting when you look at the gaming scene and you can look at streamers in particular, right? When you talk about, you know, let's talk about Series E, right? We get, I think we get great viewership on our stream. But at the same time, when you have the biggest names in the scene that are also streaming at the same time, Imperial House stream is always going to crush. So when you look at then compare, you know, a, a similar situation for Venn, you can look at the very broad content that they do. But then you look at, you know, people and uh, people in this community are so dedicated to the very specific personalities that they love, whether they're specific content creators or specific players. And it seems like some of those broad strokes approaches like Venn ignore the fact that people want to just see their favorite player talking about it, their favorite player playing the game. And I think there has to be some sort of a balance struck on that side uh, to really get the numbers that you're looking for for this kind of project. And it's, uh, I think it's a very difficult balance to strike, uh, but it's, you know, and obviously sad to see for Venn, I think. They've obviously got a lot of very talented, very good people over there and, uh, you know, hate to see them having to do furloughs, but hopefully 
the company gets acquired by somebody else and they can build it back up into something that they hope to be in the first place, but it's obviously tough news. Yep. Obviously hate to see it. So our best out to everybody at Venn. Uh, hope they keep doing well. Uh, final topic for today. We highlighted one shooter a little bit earlier. We got to uh, talk about the other big title in the shooter genre, and it is Halo Infinite. We had big news mm. late last week. Halo Infinite will not be launching with co-op for the campaign or Forge. And I'm curious, what I really want us to discuss is, do you feel like this is a significant stain on the release of the game or are you like i think it's fine it'll come eventually which it, it, it will right yeah, yeah but in terms of the release how big of a, um, an issue do you think this is well forge i don't think is a big deal okay like i think forge being added in a, you know a couple months <clears throat> or whatever it is after the release is totally fine if it takes like a year the game will literally die but forge is like one of the coolest things, right? Halo 3 sure. Forge. Everybody loved Halo 3 Forge, making your own maps. Me and my buddies did that for hours. Yeah. We had all these super intricate maps that we would build out, you know, and, and just play them for all day long. And um, I know, obviously, there's plenty of um, map designers and whatnot that mm -hmm. are, are going to want to really get their hands on it, creating mini game, all that kind of stuff, sure. right? It's I think Forge is a really, really key component of the community for Halo. Uh, but I don't necessarily think it has to come out frame one, right? Yeah. You don't it's like... You don't need to be in there making a, a brand new level without even like scratching the game, yeah. right? So I think I think Forge is okay. I don't think that's a huge deal, but I really do hope that it's very close on their timeline. Now. Sure, um, kind of similar to what we were talking about with the Battle Royale last week, where I really hope that they have a they have a very intricate timeline that mm -hmm. they can hit, where it's like <clears> if we're launching here, you know, six weeks after that this comes out, six weeks after that we're going to release this, and they yeah. just constantly keep rolling out to keep that hype. Um, I think that's a huge piece of it. Now. The other component would be um, co-op. Sure. What? Why would they not let you play co-op? Like it's it's bad enough that they <clears throat> they scratched split screen off of the last couple Halos, right? Because like sure. that's astronomical in itself. Because I was like the foundation of Halo. Yes. But now to not even to, not, to <clears throat> again not launch with co-op, I just I I guess I don't see I don't see how they didn't make it in. And I also don't see how it's not a top priority. Sure. Because, like, not expecting, like, especially as this is, like, the first Halo game sure. to tackle this generation, mm -hmm. right? Because, obviously, we grew up on Halo. Not everybody grew up on Halo, right? The, when, by the time of Halo 5 and when I were coming out, there was there was no scene. There was no longevity to that. It's only the old school players still mm -hmm. playing Halo 5, right? Same thing with Master Chief Collection. That also didn't tackle people. So, especially since you couldn't play it with locally. Sure. Because how, <laughs> how am I... Supposed to, like, let's say I had a kid and I wanted to, like, show them the new Halo genre. I can't even play with them. I have to buy two Xboxes, two Halos, and then we can play multiplayer together? Is that is that, is that where so, we're at? Like, So I, I think that's an, I, I think that's an inter interesting discussion. But when you talk about drawing the new players in, and when you look at kind of the state of gaming right now where everybody's releasing Battle Royales, all this stuff, multiplayer is actually so big. I feel like in terms of building that new halo audience i don't think the lack of co-op for campaign actually hurts them that much on release but you don't think that it I hurts think, our demographic no 100 the the classic halo players that are like this is just my next halo title in the genre i think they're not gonna like it me personally i'm not that bent out of shape about it i hope it isn't too long but i typically if i get a new halo game i'm going to play the campaign through by myself first mm. and then eventually i'm gonna get Three of my friends together. We're gonna to do the legendary run yeah. and, and 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 play it. So I I don't want to wait a long time, right? Couple of months, maybe like three or four months tops. Nobody's I'm gonna be a little annoyed. Nobody's playing the Halo campaign three months after the game came out. I mean, that is I will it still is over. I will still go point. back and play the legendary run on Halo Three on Master Chief Collection to this day. Okay, which is I mean, but base. you're playing it with for nostalgia purposes. Sure, sure, right? sure. Which is totally fair. But a brand new game that just comes out, nobody's yeah. playing that on repeat for months, and then after they beat it, three months later they want to play it again. Like I don't know, I, I'm not, I'm I, not completely sold on it. It doesn't make sense to me. Sure, especially I, I, a game that's focused on multiplayer. Yes. Let us play the story so we can play the story and then we can play multiplayer for the rest of the yeah. time. Like, I mean, ah. like me personally, I don't ah. think it's going to bug me that much because I'm going to be heavily invested in the multiplayer. And I think 
It's when you talk marketing. about building that new audience, I also don't think it's going to hurt that much because I think these new refresher audiences are very multiplayer centric and especially because they also aren't necessarily going to have that Master Chief nostalgia. I don't think they're going to care that much about the campaign only being solo. Um, again, I agree. I don't want to wait that long. Um, but I'm just curious about it. Again, I'm no game developer and I don't necessarily have background on this, but I'm curious how much, if you've built the solo campaign, is it really that much extra work to build it co-op? Like it I, I have no idea. The answer has to be yes. Sure. Otherwise they would do it. Yeah. I don't like know. there's no way they're doing it as a marketing play. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know Def what I mean? I agree. Like, I no, agree. No chance. It is <clears throat> greatly bothering me <laughs> and I All hope I know, that they can, you know. Fix it however they can. The multiplayer and the solo campaign better be so polished on release. Like, if you're going to push these features, fine. But the game better come out with what it's launching with better be incredible. And I will say, the feedback that I've seen since the uh, the alpha that they did, uh, or the like the playtest that they did, uh, about a month ago, I think was fantastic. A lot of players seemed to enjoy it. A lot of the footage that I saw was fantastic, and the the gameplay looked extremely polished. So I'm excited, but it better come out and be pretty impeccable from the start. And if that is, then cool. I, I'm willing to be a little more patient for the other features. But I agree. I think Forge, especially, is important to the longevity of the game, right? Because like I definitely didn't use Forge as much in the early, maybe the first year or so of like Halo 3's release, but after I had just grind, I like grinded so everything. many hours yeah. of multiplayer, then it's just like, cool, let's go into Forge and we can do all the mini games. I mean, we were playing them here uh, in the office just last week. So I, uh, I think it's a very important to Don't the watch longevity the uh, of the title. So uh, obviously bummed to hear that, but still excited for Halo Infinite. I wonder, I I wonder if there's going to be any recourse on as far as custom lobbies and spectating goes obviously as tournament organizers that's a big piece for us true so you know i know a lot of games don't launch with custom servers they don't launch with uh spectating capabilities etc and mm. that would be a, a pretty big bummer on our that would well, feel so. maybe a little bit tied to forge i guess i don't i'm just saying if they don't have forge and they don't even have co-op what are the odds we have a fully functioning spectator client for esports I don't know. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's a lot of hard questions lot of coming out question there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's going to be interesting to watch. I'm, I'm still. I don't know. It's like when we talk about, you know, we're getting Back for Blood coming out in October, and then Halo, uh, Halo Infinite, uh, sometime in the holiday season. I'm just like, bro, it's 2008 all over again, right and I'm back. so here yeah, for it. Yeah, like, yeah. I feel like I'm just, uh, uh, you know, a fresh high school freshman. Uh, one more time, and I'm just like, I'm very excited. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's going to be an interesting release. And uh, I know players are super excited for it. I hope that, you know, it can pop off the way that I think the developer, that 343, is really hoping it does. And this can be, you know, the revival for the Halo scene that we've been hoping for uh, for a long time. And it's just going to be an interesting story to follow. And obviously, you know, as we get more news about that, we're going to talk about it here on the show. So that is going to do it, though, for uh, everything we wanted to talk about today. We ran through uh, a bunch of different games, a bunch of uh, big news across the scene. Uh, any final thoughts, Luke? Um, I'm absolutely not playing the Halo campaign until they bring co-op in. Fair enough. And... Uh, let us know what you guys are going to do. I'd love to <laughs> yeah, from, from for real. Let us know your thoughts. We wait for the co-op. Will you play the solo all the mm -hmm. way through? Will you play both? I would say that that'd be, that'd be great to kind of know uh, where your guys' heads are at. Um, obviously, appreciate, appreciate you guys cruising in. Appreciate you chatting with me today, as always. Always a pleasure. Um, I know that we're obviously super excited to start bringing guests on to speak with us. So let us know if you guys have any specific do uh, we, pro players or anything that you guys might be interested in. Do we want to tell them? Of course. I mean, as yeah. a teaser for our next week's episode, we do have Zach Mazur, yes. uh, Cloud9 Professional Apex Legends Pro, who will be coming on and chat with us a little bit. I think it would be a great chance for us to do a deep dive into the ALGS, the new you know Part 2 ALGS, yep. uh, Series E, talking and explain more about that to you guys, as a lot of our new viewers probably don't necessarily fully understand or, or aware of what Series E really is. So that would be a great chance for us to really dive into that as well. Um, but overall, guys, if, if there's specific, you know, pros or influencers or, or hosts, commentators, whatever it is that you guys sure. are interested in us bringing on, let us know. Because we really can reach out and just, you know, we love having conversations with people from the industry. So uh, let us know if you guys have any thoughts on that. 
Um, and other than that, I'd, I'd love to know what, you, uh, what you've been playing this week. What have I been playing this week? Uh, still getting back into Valorant. That's been fun. Nice. Uh, League, I've actually played a little bit more mid lane. I've been switching out of support, which has been interesting. TSM's looking for... Uh... Yeah, a new mid laner. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> call, call me, Reggie. <laughs> I'll have Luke send you my number. Uh, nothing crazy okay. new this week. Just kind of on my typical multiplayer grinds. And, uh, you know, in other news, Evolving Skies came out. If you guys are Pokemon fans, the new set, uh, we it officially releases on the 28th. Uh, but obviously, you know, Luke's got some connections and there's some local stores here that put our Pokemon partners that are able to sell the set early. So I know we've got some uh, awesome stuff to open on our streams on Thursday. I'm really excited about that. I am. I need excited. some alt arts. Give me some alt arts for the uh, evolutions, please. Oh, give them to us. So yeah, super excited about that. Uh, if you guys are listening to the show, thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you, you know, whatever platform you want to be on, we are currently on uh, YouTube. The VODs are there as well as you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if there are other platforms that you guys prefer for podcasts, please let us know. We would love to come to your favorite platforms. But thanks for listening to the episode. Make sure to tune into uh, everything we go on, we got going on on Esports Arena as well. We got Series E every Tuesday and Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific. We got our Pokemon streams on Thursday, Final Circles, uh, Fridays. That all lives at twitch.tv slash esports arena. And if you need any news on anything else going on with us, esportsarena.com is your place to go. My name's Yeso. My co-host Shimona Heat over here. Absolute blast to hang out with you guys here today. That is a wrap on episode number two. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.